I'm Terry Smith. Uh, I'm currently an assistant professor at Western Illinois University in Macomb, Illinois. I'm in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, uh, doing social studies methods classes, and I supervise uh, teacher education uh, students in the field. Before uh, being a university professor, I taught 14 years in the elementary classroom uh, in third grade in Texas and second and third grade in Illinois and then uh, another nine years in uh, Hannibal, Missouri, teaching fourth grade. So what I want to share with you today uh, are some of the methods and techniques that I found effective uh, over the years in teaching in the classroom that bring real experiences and real meaningful learning to kids, and that's basically project-based learning. So what I'm going to show you, tell you a little bit about uh, what I did in my elementary years and then what I'm doing right now with my pre-service teachers at the university. When we use the term project-based learning, um, that's a term that is defined by different people in different ways. Uh, some people believe there's got to be a, a specific project that you do. And there must be a certain kind of a question to start it. And that's one way of looking at project-based learning. I sort of have a, a world view of that being a philosophy of teaching, uh, that your classroom should operate like a project. That is, you're doing things in which Everybody can participate. So to me, project-based learning means we have a goal in mind, we have uh, academic content that we're using, we have students talking, speaking, using tools, uh, using technology, uh, all sorts of things where there, we have active learning. And most importantly, we have the students doing things that they want to do. So we have, we have that affinity to pull them together. So in project-based learning, if your students are enjoying, they, they like what they're doing, that they're actually in the palm of your hands as a teacher because now you can bring in all the real world content you want and it will actually stick. Uh, so that's my, my basic uh, definition of what project-based learning is. So looking at project-based learning, we can look at it uh, in a scale fashion. We can think of you might be doing a project within your classroom that's could be all built around a vegetable garden. It could be all built around raising butterflies. Or you might say, let's take this project and connect with another classroom. Maybe we're going to Skype or we're going to have email pals. But when we do so, we're going to connect uh, literacy. We're going to, maybe we're going to connect math. Maybe we're going to connect language. Maybe we're going to share music. So I might do a single classroom project or I might do classroom to classroom. Or then there's the large scale, uh, the, the type of project when you have multiple schools involved. And those have been the types of things that I've done over my career as a teacher and used all of those very, very effectively. And, and, and I felt like always enhanced student engagement to what I wanted kids to learn. So I'm going to give you some examples now of some of the large scale projects that I've done in, during my career in the elementary classroom as well as at the university. So uh, my initial experiences were doing individual projects in the classroom. Uh, science projects and, and math projects and literacy projects, writing newspapers, things like that. And then I realized that there are other classes doing these things and I began my journey into classroom to classroom kind of projects. And then I heard about projects that you could join that were going on around the world. Um, let me tell you about the very first one I ever did in about 1995. I read in a teacher magazine about the Vendi uh, around the world sailboat race. And by joining that project with my third graders, I received all this information from these, all these sailboat people, a mock-up of the boat, a map of the journey, and latitude and longitude positions as this race went on around the world. That enabled me to uh, divide up all the different people that were sailing among the students in my classroom and track those, those people around the world, and then build that into uh, a meaningful set of learning experiences in the classroom. So that was me interacting with my kids in a global project. But then the next step was when I joined a project in which many other schools are also involved. And the very first one I joined was called uh, the Monster Project. And I'll tell you right away, that was uh, invented by a kindergarten teacher in Florida. And at the time, it was an email project. And people did the work in the project, and then they exchanged photographs. Um, and so what happened in the project actually is people share the different parts of a friendly monster, they describe those, they send them all back into the project area, and then 
uh, in their classrooms, they work on math and social studies and science and literacy. We bring in specific kinds of media. We have kids doing video. We have kids doing poetry. We have kids writing recipes. Uh, and we have kids uh, reading the biographies of other people in the project. Well, I wanted to mention that it started small because as that teacher left the project, I took over the project and I've been running that monster project now for oh, about 12 years. And at this point, uh, we have 40 to 50 classrooms involved in it from all around the world rather than just across the United States. We have, we have people from France, we have people from Taiwan, we have people from Canada, people from Connecticut. It, it's, it's all over. And you can imagine that once you engage in a situation like that, that you encounter experiences that you're going to uh, use with your students that you possibly never planned for. So the Monster Project is one that is backed by standards. I quickly found out that more people will join projects if they have a link they can click on and it runs through the standards that, uh, that apply to the different things that are happening in the project, such as literacy standards, specific math standards, social study standards, and then standards on technology. Those are all the kinds of things that we build into the Monster Project and then we have this global sharing of information, kids using media, kids using technology, but also that not to forget the teacher. We have this personal network that's formed that all these teachers now begin to share information and they actually form their own little personal networks after a while. So that is a, in basically the, the manner in which the Monster Project works right now. Now the Monster Project is basically designed as an entry level project for any teacher who's never done a technology project before. It's basically a K through six. In fact, we've had pre-K classrooms in there. Now I want to I want to change the pace a bit here and go to a larger global project, which is one called Landmark. Uh, Landmark is part of an organizational project setting that's run by KidLink International. And I'm the project manager for just one project. Landmark is a project in which students uh, find culturally significant locations in their own countries or anywhere in the world. It could be involved with a city, could be involved with a geographic location, could be involved with a historical event, could be in, involved with a local tradition, uh, all kinds of things. And what they do is they create nine interesting clues and we send those all into the project. Those clues are sent out to as many as 70 different teams, some years 90 different teams, with kids in Russia, once again, this is global, it's in Russia, the United States, Canada, England, and over a three week period, the students all ask questions back and forth that must be answered with a yes or a no. It's called polar questioning. They can't guess where the, where the landmarks are, they can only ask questions. So it's a major project in social studies, in organization, in communication, in collaboration, and at the end of this three week period, all the guesses are sent in and it gets a little competitive because that's when the top landmark finders are announced on the project website. Well, and continuing along with the idea I started with of we're doing this because kids want to do these things. It, it taps into their natural interests or natural curiosity. So I'd like to take uh, another project look that takes us away from typical global projects, as I'll say, and move into something called virtual projects. And this is where uh, your students actually go into a virtual world and interact with other worlds. And this is a program that I used for many years called Quest Atlantis. It started at Indiana University. It's now at Arizona State University. It works like this. As a classroom teacher, you acquire, you bring your students into the virtual world. They all get usernames. They go into the virtual world walking around as avatars and they're working on all sorts of different quests, mathematics, art, uh, literature, uh, recycling, different things like this. But while they're there, we need to remember, this is a global multi-user environment. So for example, my fourth graders at different times ran into other students doing quests in there who are from Montreal, or who are from Turkey, or who are from the United Kingdom. And those are other students in a protected educational environment working on quests in which if you encounter someone else, it's sort of like just being in the supermarket and meeting someone and going, hey, I'm, I'm Terry, who are you? Where are you? Who's your teacher? Where's your school? And kids actually converse back and forth as avatars in the virtual world. And so Quest Atlantis is now one of those kinds of ways that we continue to appeal to different kinds of learning styles 
And we talk about everybody being able to participate. And one of the really, really interesting things about this is when we think about special needs students or students with disabilities, when you go into a virtual world, you have the ability to run, to walk, to fly, to become someone else, to try a new identity. And all the research tells us that's when learning really happens, when you're actually trying a new identity, the reader, the writer, the scientist, what, whatever that might be. But that's one of the ways that Quest Atlantis was a very, very effective project approach uh, in addition to the typical global projects. So, so clearly we live in a, a, a hugely global environment right now. We talk about this in education all the time, that our students are more connected throughout the world. And in order to make this happen, we need teachers who have a global perspective. And that is the type of thing that I'm working on at Western Illinois University, is to help pre-service teachers be able to join these projects, be able to try this out, and to go on and begin teaching in this fashion, to bring this into the schools. Um, so what do we do? What do we do from here? I mean, what's the, what's the next step? Um, and I would say we start simply. If you're a teacher and you've never done a project before, search on the internet. Go to the, go to the Monster Project. Go to the Landmark Project. Just join the project and see what happens. And you'll see how quickly that you begin to catch on to how this works, how you're doing a, almost a lesson plan that is of a global nature now because you're, in, you're involving your students in contacts that go far, far beyond the classroom, taking on a, a global perspective, as we said before.